The date was April 26th, 1717. A ship dubbed the Wida had been infiltrated by pirates and was carrying gold, jewelry, and valuables worth in excess of hundreds of millions of dollars. Over the choppy waters amidst a rough storm, it sank, taking the gold and crew down with it. The famed shipwreck eluded discovery for over 260 years, sending treasure hunters, historians, and underwater archaeologists of a seemingly never-ending chase to nothing and nowhere. But then, thanks to one man, a lucky explorer by the name of Barry Clifford, we have our answers. The Wida set out for its maiden voyage in early 1716. It measured 110 feet or 34 meters in length and could whip through the waters at speeds up to 13 knots or 15 miles per hour. Sure, it transported and traded precious metals, sugar, jewelry, and ivory, but at its core, the Wida was a slave ship built to transport over 100 humans between England, Western Africa, and the Caribbean. When you discover who commissioned the building of the ship, you'll understand why. The man behind the commissioning was Sir Humphrey Morris, a former member of the British Parliament. During his time, he was widely spoken as the highest-ranking slave merchant in all of London. Besides its main purpose of transporting slaves, what made the Wida unique was that it wasn't another run-of-the-mill vessel. The Wida was the front-runner, the icon, and the flagship of a five-ship fleet. Typically following in its wake were the Mary Ann, the Mary Ann, the Ann, and the Fisher. For 1716, Wida was no slouch, and she was a sizable ship. And she packed a hell of a punch, no doubt about it. With 18 six-pound cannons on board, it would take some serious force to overthrow her. And yet, in late February of 1717, that force came in a hurry in the form of Samuel Black Sam Bellamy, the wealthiest pirate in recorded history and one of the faces of the golden age of piracy who would do whatever it took to seize the Wida from the captain of the time, Lawrence Prince. You see, Prince was at the helm of the Wida when it was navigated through the windward passage between Cuba and Hispaniola, the landmass we know today as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It was here, just after the Wida had departed Jamaica, that Bellamy and his 150-man crew eyed their opportunity and aimed to take the Wida for themselves. For three days, Black Sam Bellamy chased Captain Prince on the seas before the latter finally surrendered his ship near the Bahamas. At this point, Wida was in the hands of the pirates, but since the former captain didn't put up a fight and went down peacefully without a struggle, Bellamy decided to give one of his former, smaller ships, the Sultana, to Prince, as well as about 20 pounds in silver and gold as a gesture of goodwill. That's the equivalent of over $5,000 US in today's value. Compared to the 180 50 pound sacks of gold that Bellamy would soon have stored in between the ship's decks, and noting that its equivalent modern day worth would have been about $142.5 million, it was a meager price to pay for a peaceful surrender. Now that Bellamy and his crew had control of the British flagship Wida, they set their compasses for north and sailed towards the eastern coast of North America, past the Carolina states, aiming to make it to New England, specifically the central coast of Maine, making sure to steal, loot, and capture anything and everything of value from other vessels they came across along the way. Meanwhile, during one of the stops along the coast, Bellamy had added another 30 cannons below the decks for some extra firepower. After a couple months of sailing up the coast, the fateful night of April 26, 1717 rolled around. As Bellamy steered his stolen ship through the choppy waters near Chatham, Massachusetts, which is right here, the skies turned gray, the fog rolled in, and the crew knew they were in for a rocky night on the seas. As it turns out, they had no idea what was coming. The storm proved far more powerful and damaging than they could have ever anticipated. Gale force winds were whipping in from east and northeast, which pushed the vessel dangerously close to the breakwater along the shores of Cape Cod. At midnight, the winds had reached 70 miles per hour, or 110 kilometers an hour, and thrashed waves of upwards of 30 feet into the sides of the ship. Eventually, Mother Nature battered Wida into a sandbar, which caused the mainmast to snap, leading to its capsize. Over 4.1 tons of high-quality silver and gold, more than 60 cannons, and over 140 people were thrust out of the ship and into the water, left to sink to the ocean floor. Of the 146 souls aboard the Wida, only two men survived, and as for the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of money, bullion, treasure, goods, jewelry, and merchandise, it was never seen again. At least, not for a few centuries. Once news broke that a fully loaded pirate ship carrying a near priceless load had capsized, word spread like wildfire. By morning, hundreds of marine salvagers from the Cape Cod area, who were known as wreckers back in the day, were scouring the seafloor hoping to get their silver and treasure and take it home with them. After hearing about the shipwreck for himself, Samuel Shute, the royal governor of Massachusetts and New Hampshire at the time, sent out a trusty colleague, Captain Cyprian Southack, a local salvager and cartographer. While Cyprian Southack 
would come back with nothing but a few conclusions and small scraps of worthless pieces of shipwreck, it was the map he drew, this map, that would eventually prove to be the vital clue in the solving of the puzzle. While you may not have realized it at the time, what you see before you is a real-life pirate treasure map, and there's your X marks the spot. For centuries, the exact location of the ship, its millions of dollars worth of riches, and its historic weapons were lost. As the years passed, interest subdued, and the great wide of treasure became thought of as nothing more than a legend and speculation. Decades went by, centuries even, and by the mid-1900s, the wide was all but forgotten. But then, in 1984, one man had a breakthrough. That was Massachusetts underwater explorer Barry Clifford, who'd relied heavily on Southwick's 1717 map of the wreck site. The Wida had eluded discovery for over 260 years, which makes the fact that it was found under just 14 feet of water and 5 feet of sand all the more surprising. Clifford and his team of underwater archaeologists and explorers came across the site close to the Wellfleet coastline right about here. Honestly? It was a breakthrough. It was revolutionary. This one man had managed to uncover a long hidden treasure trove, or at least a significant part of it. In the three decades since the discovery in 1984, Clifford and his team have continued to unearth valuable artifacts after valuable artifact. Over 200,000 items from the ship, including shimmering coins and cannons, have been itemized and documented. One major find in the fall of 1985 was the ship's bell, inscribed with the words, The Wida Galley 1716. With that, the Wida became the first ever official pirate pirate shipwreck to have its identity proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Even though the ship was officially found and identified, not all of the treasure was accounted for. After all, Bellamy's Wida contained the treasure of over 53 other vessels. There was a lot of it. Could more gold have floated away over the passing centuries? Could there still be treasure hidden across the eastern American seabed? Absolutely. Remember, there were 180 bags of gold on that ship that were intended to be shared amongst the crew, and not all of them have been recovered. A few years ago, however, back in 2016, Clifford made another substantial discovery in what he refers to as the Yellow Brick Road, a path extending between two significant wide dive sites that are about 700 feet apart and have been overflowing with gold coins and artifacts in recent times. It was along this so-called Yellow Brick Road area off the coast of Wellfleet where a large metallic mass was found, a mass which allegedly houses 400,000 coins. Add that to the long list of startling expensive finds. The list now contained thousands of silver Spanish coins, dozens of cannons, hundreds of pieces and fragments of rare African gold jewelry, and handmade colonial era objects, all of which are thought to tally up to an astounding value of over $400 million, in addition to their equivalent million plus value of the ship itself. Keep in mind that there could still be plenty more loot out there waiting to be found, so who's to say that that number won't eventually exceed a billion? In the summer of 2013, Clifford took 21 trips at an overall cost of more than $200,000. Taking into account decades of searching, we can easily infer that Clifford has spent well in excess of a million bucks in the hunt for the ultimate treasure. But hey, looks like it's all paid off. Despite Wida being overthrown by pirates centuries ago, pirates continue to be a very real threat in modern times. Piracy off the coast of Somalia alone has raked in nearly half a billion dollars in ransom payments since 2005, and that doesn't even include the millions worth of stolen ships and stolen goods. While the Wida boasts a fortune unmatched by most shipwrecks, it still doesn't have top billing. That claim goes to a ship by the name of the San Jose, of which the total value of gold and jewels on board the vessel chimed in at a whopping 22 Two billion dollars with a B. Then there was the RMS Republic, rumored to be carrying a billion bucks worth of gold coins, and the Nuestra Senora de Atocha, which lost cargo now believed to be worth close to 450 million. Make no mistake, the amount of money hiding beneath the surface is unimaginable. So, what happened to the famous Wida treasure? Most of it sits in the Wida Pirate Museum in West Yarmouth, Massachusetts, which opened to the public in 2016. The highlight, of course, is the life-size replica of the original Wida galley. But what about the right? Who actually owns the treasure? Is it the property of the Coast Guard, the British, the Americans, the museum, or the Massachusetts government? Actually, None of them. You see, in 1988, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled that 100% of the wider rightfully belonged to Clifford, and local authorities weren't happy about it. Finders keepers. He was, however, required by state law to pay the 25% of the amount he recovered from the ship, plus regular income taxes. How would you react if you found some priceless treasure next time you were out for a swim at the beach? Keep it to yourself or brag about it. Share your thoughts in the comments down below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and as always, thanks so much for checking out The Richest. See you next time. Have a great day.